Hello and welcome to this USCCB Roundtable. Today, we continue to discuss the important issue of mental health. In March, we brought you a discussion about the mental health crisis of young people in this country. Today, we turn to the question of mental health among members of the clergy. With us today are Bishop Edward Burns of the Diocese of Dallas, Dr. Patricia Donahue from the St. John Vianney Center in Downington, Pennsylvania, Father James Garvey from the St. Luke Institute in Maryland, and Dr. Anthony I. Sacco, a psychologist and professor from Chatham University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Welcome everybody to the second in our roundtable series on mental health challenges. Um, this one we're going to be focusing on mental health as it affects members of the clergy. And Bishop Burns, I'd like to start with you, if I could, with the question about priests, of course. Priests in their roles as pastors, care for others spiritually. How can they care for themselves? Who's looking out for the priests? Well, I think that it is the responsibility of the bishop. It is the responsibility of the diocese. It's also a responsibility of the presbyterate to watch out for one another. And the presbyterate is the makeup of the priest within the diocese. And so there should be a fraternal concern. Um, when looking at the bishop, he should have a personal concern. Um, and the bishop needs to act uh, fraternally, pastorally, administratively. I have to say that as a bishop, and I've been a bishop for 15 years, I really take seriously the words of our Lord Jesus Christ to Peter when he said, strengthen the brothers. And so I do believe that that's a part of our apostolic mission and our relationship with our priests is to strengthen them, keep them strong, keep them vital, and, and be attentive to what their needs might be. So as a bishop, the diocese too, so that the clergy office plays an important part of, of fortifying our priests. And what are you seeing? I'm seeing hard working priests who exhaust themselves for Jesus Christ. It's just amazing how they give and give and give of themselves. And they are also people pleasers. And they wanna be there for the faithful. I see them as dedicated and committed, um, faithful, um, and, and it is important for us to make sure that they're um, strong in their ministry. Yeah, would you agree with that assessment? I would. What um, I was, the language going on in my own mind when you were speaking, Bishop, was we all need a posse. <laughs> we, you know, when they say, well, if you're making a decision to get three opinions, and you've got to have a, a, a team together in place to do that. People who are willing to look out for each other. Because many priests are living in, in uh, smaller sized rectories, often alone, um, and the isolation that that can bring um, isn't always the best environment to, uh, uh, to your own self-care. Yeah, and, I, and I also think that um, there's, you know, there's a lot more work to do than hands to do it. And I think that um, very often priests uh, have a hard time setting time boundaries or saying no to someone or they start to uh, plan something and then they have a hospital call. But um, there's just a lot of work there. I think a lot of the priests feel the responsibility that if they don't do it, who's going to do it? And that makes it hard for them to engage in self-care. They put themselves last a lot. Yeah, some of those challenges that you see out there with hardworking priests, you know, um, as the challenges mount, then you see things like depression emerge burnout emerge, anxiety, perfectionism. And those are some of the real mental health common colds that we see among priests, but we also see them among laity and other people as well too. Right. How should we distinguish spiritual health and mental health? I think those two things go really hand in hand, especially for priests. Um, I've had priests tell me that uh, the moment they stop praying is the moment their mental health also starts to deteriorate as well. So uh, they are religious people. They, their identity is as a spiritual father. And so their mental and spiritual health are, are, are one and the same, in my opinion. I would think that that's a red flag that they're kind of on the road to burnout. Yeah. Usually then they stop saying the office, they stop praying. 
Um, so now they're saying these things to people, but they're not doing them themselves. Um, and I think that that is usually a red flag that things are now starting to kind of come apart. I don't like to hear the word distinction about the two. I think they really need to be in communion. I've often seen when people come into treatment, when priests come into treatment, they'll be able to recognize that they might have emotional distress or psychological distress, but oftentimes they'll recognize, they'll state that their spiritual life is just fine. It's not until sometimes you get into the work itself that you begin to recognize that they're much more intricately linked and uh, the, the care that priest receives needs to be particularly holistic in that regard, mind, body, and spirit. I think that when the um, human side of priests really starts to take over and they start feeling the effects of being worn out, um, if they fail to pray, uh, if they're really getting the burnout. I love the words of St. Paul to Timothy when he said, fan into flame the gifts you received when I laid hands on you. And for them to really come ablaze once again with the sense of the spirit of the, the mission, the call, and also the very essence of who God created them to be, to that wellness of taking care of God's creation. And he created them to serve others, you know? And, and for, for that, I think that, again, the prayer, uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit, fanning it into flame, and the wellness of the priest go hand in hand. If I could add on to that for a second, Bishop, I, I love that phrase of kind of gifts of the Holy Spirit. Um, from a psychological point of view, one of the kind of the turning points, I think, in conversations with priests is not what's wrong with you, but what are the strengths and what are the gifts that you're bringing to ministry and how to tap back into those. And you can just see them come back alive whenever you change the conversation from, from problems and deficits to strengths and gifts. And I think that when you were mentioning the, like the common cold of things that happen, so the depression, anxiety, or addictions, I think um, for all three of those, that, that's when that split starts to happen between the, the emotional life and the, and the spiritual life. When people are depressed, they don't feel connected to anything. That often includes God. When people are anxious and full of fear, they're, they're not peaceful, they're not well-related. And then addiction separates everyone um, from everyone. So I think that um, all those things, it becomes a, a slow process that then speeds up for a lot of people. And an important thing is to try to catch it early. I, I think when there's support to notice when somebody's becoming burned out, there's so many more options that are, are easier when things are caught early, as opposed to when they kind of um, start to spiral out of control. And a, and a lot of men are alone, and so a lot of what they're going through, people don't notice. I want to affirm everything you just said, Patricia, as I always have in the past, too, when we've worked together. Um, Part of what I have as a fundamental belief, um, a slogan I use, which is that ordination or consecration is not a vaccination. And that most of the challenges that the priests are going through are the same challenges that uh, everyone goes through as a human being. There'll be midlife, there'll be ups and downs. Uh, and priests who are caregivers um, sometimes need to learn, especially fresh out, uh, to put the oxygen mask on first, mm -hmm. to take care of themselves so they can take care of others. It's so refreshing to hear from each of you because each of you work in different ways to support the priests in their spiritual and mental well-being. And I'd like to ask you a more personal question about what is the most satisfying part of your job in this work? Uh, <laughs> and it comes right to me with that, but I think... Um, First of all, it's it's wonderful to be able to work with um, priests and men and women religious. You know, they, they're generally very motivated. Um, they really want to get back to ministry. This is what they, they're called to do. Um, and I think that being able to work with them and help them through some of the situations that they've kind of gotten into um, brings them a sense of healing and wholeness. It's a wonderful process to see. And then they go out and they touch a thousand more lives. So it's a process that just really gives I could reinforce that point. Um, church history has showed us that one bad priest can have a ripple effect into uh, into the community that you know negatively impacts 
hundreds and thousands of people, but the most satisfying thing is then when the opposite happens. You know, you help one priest experience health and wholeness and tap back into their strengths, and then you can see that have such a positive ripple effect out into the community. Because the laity, they, they're they cheerleaders for priests. They want their priests to do well, and they want their priests to live a healthy, holy, happy life. And so when laity pick up on their priests doing that, it's like they rally behind them. I, I would agree that uh, continued formation is, is really important for that. You know, I also think having healthy relationships, which um, you were mentioning, Bishop, is really important, and I think that becomes difficult. So I think that the men that do form solid relationships and feel a, kind of a band of brothers have so much more support, and they also have people looking out for them. But I think when a priest becomes isolated, when they don't feel very close to other men in the presbyterate, um, they are worried about, can they trust people? Um, you know, they're worried about their image. There's a lot, like a lot of times people want to, they're playing a role and they know that it's important, but they can get a little lost in that role. And it's hard for them to really be honest then with some people with what they need. And the most beneficial people to do that would, would be other priests, other brother priests. So I think the interpersonal like relationship piece of it is important. And there's also just the body physical parts. So, um, you know, a lot of times a, a lot of priests don't have some basic skills, like they've never really learned how to like cook, for example. And that becomes a real difficulty, like at St. Javiani Center in our lifestyle balance program, you know, we have priests that come in and say they eat fast food six times a week. You know, they don't, they, they don't have time to shop, they don't have time to cook, they don't know how to, you know, get five meals out of a rotisserie chicken kind of thing. And so those basic um, sleeping, these basic, um, you know, health hygiene things can often fall by the wayside. I think healthy priests are very mindful of that, exercising. I think it's true. You have to, as a priest, it's important to help equip the priest with an element of self-awareness and a self-mastery. I think it's important that they listen to their bodies. It's important that they are attentive to how they're doing. They know if they're firing on all pistons or not. You know, when they mount the pulpit to proclaim a gospel, that they can see reflected off the faith, the faces of the people they're preaching to, whether or not they're making a connection or not. So I think that they have to be attentive to their own bodies, their own self-awareness, and then also have the discipline for a self-mastery, you know, to get out there to do what is necessary, um, to begin firing on all pistons. I agree. I think um, the self-care and the healthy boundaries and taking time to take care of yourself, making sure you have a day off, making sure you're getting exercise and eating properly, these things are just fundamental. And I think, too, there's a lot the laity can do to promote this also. Uh, just someone coming up to the priest and waiting for him after Mass or something, and instead of coming to him with a problem saying, I'm here to check on you. How are you doing today? How do you carry all of this? Uh, and kind of opening the door for uh, him to respond. So how might a parishioner tell their pastor that they have concerns about his well-being. So I, we've heard from you, Father Jim. Other thoughts, suggestions? If I can add to that. Yes, please do. <laughs> Some of, a, a good advice that I heard one parent give another is, after a certain age, you can't tell your children what to do, but you can plant in the minds the questions you think they should be asking themselves. <laughs> so... I would use that kind of approach uh, in, you know, in saying, uh, in, in, in conversation with, an, uh, with a priest. What would that look like, Father Jim? Well, it could like, do you, you know, uh, how, how, uh, how is your diet going? You know, uh, what if I were to bring in a meal that you could simply reheat? Could you, would that, would be, is that some way that I might support you? Um, what, what are you doing for fun? How do you relax? What, are, what is your entertainment? What's good on a streaming service that, that helps you unwind? Human questions. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm thinking too, just even um, approaching the priest to talk with them, not because you need something, but just to see how they're doing, talk about sporting game, but to have a conversation that's not necessarily something that someone's looking for um, from them. 
I, I do know that there's some things that probably are not very helpful. Um, <laughs> so I'm uh, in thinking of coming here. Um, I had one priest come up to me and said, um, could you please say not to give priests alcohol? Um, it's like a gift that people like to give. Um, one priest mentioned one time that he got 24 bottles of alcohol at Christmas time. You know, it's not healthy for anybody. Um, and, uh, and another a priest had said, you know, my parishioners love me to death and they knew I loved drinking. So they gave me a lot of alcohol. They were loving me to death. Um, so the idea being the idea of like healthy options is, I think, really important because I, a lot of priests have no time to do these kind of things. Um, Same for a box of chocolates. And a pie. Like, what is one? What is one? What is one man living alone going to do with a pecan pie? I mean, just, <laughs> so things like that might, that might be thought out a little bit. What would be helpful for them? So. That's why regifting is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you. I think that uh, it, it's also important for the lay faithful to ex, uh, express a, uh, a support to their priest. Um, for priests to receive a text message from a faithful, uh, to say your homily was fantastic today. You know, it just is for him to throw back a thumbs up. You know, it really helps. Um, it puts a spring in his step, you know, as he, he goes through ministry. But also for the faithful to express concerns of his well-being is an expression of love and affection. And, and so that has to be exercised also. I agree with everything that was said, and I'll just add that, you know, I think uh, laity can really um, emphasize with priests that, um, you know, as a priest, you are the spiritual father, which means that you don't have to do everything in a parish. <laughs> um, and as, a, as laity, we can bring our strengths to parish work to help with the workload distribution. So if there's a leak in the roof, you don't have to get up there and fix it. We have roofers in the parish that can bring their expertise to that kind of project. And so sometimes um, what I've seen in, in my clinical practice is priests get kind of a, a messiah complex. They have to be the one solving every single problem. Um, whenever there's lady that can bring those strengths and expertise to problem solving, it's just working together to, to collaborate on that. I also think being understanding um, of the realities of the current situation can help. So, you know, there's a thing where people say, oh, you know, Father, I'm concerned about you, but don't take away my mass. <laughs> uh, <right? laughs> so uh, they understand that the, the things are difficult, but a lot of people are resistant to change. And we're kind of in a situation where we have to have change just for reality and just for the health of our priests. So I think understanding that piece of it and expressing that you understand that to the priest can be very helpful. That's really important. That goes all the way down to someone's favorite pew, right? <laughs> um, something as easy as moving in or switching seats can have a big impact in the parish and the culture that helps the priest. I think also, much like what you said, Anthony, before about collaborating and getting together as parishioners, that to um, identify resources within the parish, like if you have a nutritionist, or if you have a, a physical trainer, if if you have, you know, people, a nurse, you know, that, that can really, and you know, in that expression of support to a priest, simply say, how we could ever be a support to you, let us know. And, and to really, um, um, you know, uh, just pull all these things together as a resource for the priest to stay strong would be a blessing. That's great. Yeah, there's so much talent in the parish Correct. already that they can tap, they can tap yeah. into. Yeah, Truly tap it. Yeah. So how might a priest begin a conversation with uh, a superior or a colleague when they have concerns or when they notice an apparent problem? Bishop Burns talked about this at the beginning in terms of kind of diocesan level supports. And I think that helps to set an expectation, a tone, and a culture that helps a priest have that conversation. And so if there's someone in the diocese that has a title of kind of uh, clergy support or something like that, the stories I've heard from priests are, you know, if, if they know they can go to someone and it's confidential, it's expected, um, they're more than willing to kind of seek the support that they need. And so it, it definitely starts uh, at the diocesan level and setting the culture and the expectation. I think too, if there's already um, you know, some relationship there, it's easier to, to uh, ask those kind of questions or express that kind of concern. 
Dr. Randstrom uh, at St. John Vianney had used the term spontaneous acts of presence, which means checking in with people. <laughs> so spontaneously just checking in on someone can mean a lot. And, and when you know someone cares, I think you're more willing to hear than their concerns for you. If you don't really have much of a relationship, then it can seem like, I think people feel like you're kind of getting in my business. So um, I think that that can be helpful. But certainly hearing it from peers can mean a lot. If someone says, you know, wow, I think you've been doing a lot, are you okay? And I think that the human formation piece is, is huge. And that would be things like emotional intelligence, social intelligence, communication, um, uh, being able to uh, resolve conflicts, sexual integration, all of these are just the human parts of us. And I agree that when they're, um, when they're not addressed or they're not developing, um, then they become very problematic. Mm -hmm. I think you're spot on in terms of pointing to the seminary and, and formation at that level. So much can be prevented if you have a healthy seminary experience and there's an expectation that you can seek help and talk about your mental health and seminary makes it so much easier whenever you're ordained and you have those problems yeah. as a priest. We all have wounds. We're human beings. Um, I'm a big fan of the Doubting Thomas who wanted to see the wounds to be sure that it was Christ because that's what we all carry. We have wounds in life. And the earlier I think that um, priests and seminarians are exposed to getting help, the more likely they will be to continue getting it in there. Uh, as their ministry develops. So at the seminarian level, et cetera, it would be great for the human formation to be coaxed along with some good structured programming. I think one of the nice things that you've seen over the last maybe five, 10 years or so in seminaries is in-house counselors. And you know that's a tremendous resource, I think, for seminarians and, again, sets the culture that, hey, there's someone here I can go to and um, I can talk about my mental health, get the support I need, and keep going in formation. I do think that you know, if, you know, if you were watching this and that you are a priest and that you are struggling with whatever it might be, I think um, I would hope that this would encourage um, the priest to, to reach out for help. I think a lot of times people come in for treatment and they think they're the only one struggling with whatever this is, and they've carried this burden by themselves yeah. for a long time. Very good point. And uh, it's really unfortunate they're not the only one, and there are solutions. So um, where yeah. where can they turn, Patricia? Well, I think that there's a, a few options. I think that there could be resources within their own diocese that they, that they can do for outpatient work. Um, they could always come for an assessment at, at a place like St. John Vianney. St. Luke's. Um, I think reaching out um, to their bishop for help, that's really a lot of guys' first step. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times when someone reaches out uh, to their bishop to help get the help, um, it, it really just opens everything up. It, yeah. it works really very quickly. In my diocese, the, my priests know that there's a bank of psychologists. They have their name, contact information, and we have an established relationship with all of them that they don't even have to come to me. They just simply go straight to that psychologist. The psychologist assigns them a number, and when that psychologist sends us a bill, we pay it so that we don't know to, we don't need to know who and what priest yeah. went to them. It's anonymous. And with that comes a freedom for them to, to, to seek that help that they, they need. And so I'm, I'm, it's just some of the ways that we can do uh, what we need to do to help our yeah. brothers. There's still so much stigma with mental health care, mm -hmm. uh, even among professionals and, and people working in professional ministry as well. Um, that anonymity that you provide is, is something that we've worked with with other communities too. And we will handle the billing and uh, and all of that in a confidential manner with the diocese. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you, Bishop Burns, Patricia, Father Jim, and Anthony. It's a pleasure to have you here and kind of addressing the stigma, as you mentioned, Father Jim. So we really appreciate having you here today and starting this conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for joining us.